The British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, after a wretched winter in the trenches, was in no state to support a French offensive until the early spring of 1915. We'd been brought up on histories of the Boer War and patriotism and heroics and everything, and we thought the war was going to be over before we could get there. However, in about half a minute, all that had gone. I, I just wondered what the devil had got into, <laughs> because um, it was nothing but mud and filth, and all the chaps who were already there were, well, they looked like tramps. They were all plastered and filth and dirt unshaven. However, knowing that the War Council in London was considering operations in the Dardanelles and Balkans, its senior commanders feared that unless the BEF made a positive contribution soon, resources might be diverted from the Western Front. The appointment of Lieutenant General Sir William Robertson as BEF's Chief of Staff in January also brought a more robust approach to the work of General Headquarters. By mid-February, a plan was approved for an attack by Haig's First Army on a narrow 2,000-yard front in Flanders. The plan was simple. The aim was to eliminate the German salient around Neuve-Chapelle and threaten Lille, an important road and rail junction. The First Army's planning provided the BEF with a valuable template for future set-piece trench assaults. Photographic reconnaissance by the Royal Flying Corps facilitated the production and distribution of detailed trench maps and enabled the assaulting units to rehearse the initial phase of the attack. For the first time, precise artillery timetables were issued, and every gun that could be spared was sent to the front to counter the German artillery. Incidentally, every time our artillery opened up on them at that particular time, they would come back tenfold. If our artillery fired about five or six rounds, they'd fire 50 to 60 back at us. But all was it was that unequal bashing that, that got the infantrymen. But we couldn't, if we'd got a gun at all, we had a machine gun, it's true, but uh, that was only a puny effort. It was these colossal shells that drained on and on, and we could do nothing about it. The earthworks and the barbed wire, such as they were, had been blown to pieces long since. And the result was that practically the whole of the front line around the town of Eat, was a series of holes in which men crouched and waited for the end. The artillery was allocated one million rounds, one-sixth of the BEF's total stocks, and was limited to a 35-minute hurricane bombardment, following which fire would be lifted from the enemy front trenches and a barrage laid to impede German reinforcement. On March 10th, the day of the assault, the surprised German defenders were numbed by the intense bombardment. That achievement was rarely to be repeated. Their wire had been extensively cut, their emplacements destroyed. The attacking brigades of the Indian Corps and Rawlinson's Fourth Corps swiftly took the front trenches. Within 20 minutes, a breach of 1,600 yards had been opened in the German line. The makings of a victory had been won. Unfortunately, delays on the flanks caused congestion in the center, and the German strong points also held up the advance, robbing the attack of its impetus. British and Indian troops had seized the German defenses on a frontage of 4,000 yards and penetrated to a maximum depth of 1,200 yards. Their advance captured Neuve Chapelle and flattened the salient west of the village, but in the end they could not exploit their early gains. Haig suspended the attack on March 12th after suffering 13,000 casualties. The BEF was now, however, taken seriously as an attacking force. Neuve Chapelle also highlighted several intrinsic problems of trench assaults. Careful preparations would generally help attackers to break the enemy position, but it was much harder to move artillery and reserves forward quickly enough to break out of these defenses before the enemy reinforcements arrived. The absence of adequate means of communication also rendered it extremely difficult for commanders to control operations 
once shells had destroyed forward telephone cables and runners had been killed or wounded. However, the effectiveness of the short hurricane bombardment was one lesson which the BEF, to its cost, largely ignored or discounted over the next two years. For the generals, the only reason to place guns on an airplane was to protect the reconnaissance aircraft. But for the pilots and observers, it was simply a means to have a go at the other fellow. Again, when the aircraft was first being used, the idea was reconnaissance, artillery spotting, that kind of thing. And you would literally have the opposing uh, fighters or flyers crossing each other in the air because um, you know, each one wanted to spy on the other one. Um, and there wasn't much they could do about that. But then some of these enterprising pilots decided to take up small arms with them. They would literally be shooting out of their cockpits at their opponents. It was not a very efficient way to fire out of an airplane. The pilots began to think, how can we point our aircraft at somebody and fire at them? Everything about using aircraft in war was invented essentially during World War I. There had been a few small uses of aircraft before in the Balkans, like 1912, but really in, in a large-scale war, everything had to be invented during World War I. Uh, and it did. It started out kind of with the lone fighter uh, doing the reconnaissance kind of thing. But as the airplanes became better and as the pilots became more familiar with what their aircraft could do, they began to experiment with the best way to use their aircraft. Uh, and so, like I said, they, they started trying mounting guns on them. Uh, they uh, began to, to understand how they might fight one another. Uh, and part of it also was a reaction just to what was going on on the ground. Um, it, was, it was slaughter on the ground. Firing pistols and carbines at a passing foe traveling at 90 miles an hour had limited effects, while attempts at dropping grenades on them from above were total failures. Mounting machine guns on the aircraft would change all that, but carrying such a weapon was a considerable burden for the lightweight, underpowered aircraft of 1914. It was also hazardous. There was a serious risk of blowing parts off your own machine with its array of struts and wires. The problem is, you have this gigantic propeller out in front of you. But um, they, they try, because, um, you know, the propeller, uh, there are voids as it, as it spins. They try mounting the machine gun very high. The first recorded aerial contest victory occurred on October 5, 1914, when a French observer, Louis Quenot, shot down a German aviatique with a Hotchkiss machine gun mounted on a Voisin B pusher rear-mounted propeller. Affording a clear field of fire to the front, pushers were one option for air combat machines. But while pusher machines were by no means ineffective, tractor machines, front mount props were faster and more maneuverable. The, the original Wright Flyer was a pusher aircraft. The, the uh, propellers were at the rear of the aircraft and literally pushed it through the air. Um, this is not the most efficient way to move an aircraft through, through the medium of the air. Um, but uh, it, it was there for visibility, um, it was the way the Wright brothers rigged their aircraft. Um, a tractor aircraft, on the other hand, has the propeller in front, uh, and it pulls the aircraft through the air. And uh, it's much more efficient to pull the aircraft through the air than to push it through the air. Um, and uh, European uh, aircraft designers are the ones who really kind of come up with this idea of putting the engine out in front with the propeller out in front. What the more skilled and adventurous pilots instinctively yearned for was a gun that they could aim simply by pointing their aircraft at the target. <laughs> 
Before the war, French and German designers discovered that it was feasible to create an interrupter gear that would pause the discharge of the machine gun each time a propeller blade was in its line of fire. But no one had been able to make it work in practice. The warring nations began to realize that they had to take control of the skies and blind the enemy from observing troop movements along the front. They try all kinds of things, but generally speaking, either the recoil from the gun or uh, bullets hitting the propeller uh, were um, uh, bad outcomes for a lot of them who uh, initially started to try and do that until, of course, um, Anthony Foker comes up with the, the, the synchronization so that you could fire a machine gun out and it would literally go through the, the voids in the propeller arc. Uh, and it wouldn't fire when a propeller blade would be right in front of your line of fire, but would once the propeller blade moved out of the way. And with the RPMs of the uh, propellers at that time, it, it was a very doable thing. Dutch designer Anthony Falker created a propeller interrupter that allowed a forward-mounted machine gun to be placed on a German Eindecker monoplane, thus creating the first true fighter plane. In July 1915, the Falker EI became operational. This was the first type of aircraft to enter service with the synchronization gear, the Falker Stangensturung. This aircraft, commonly known as the Eindecker, German for monoplane, for the first time supplied an equivalent to Allied pusher and top wing mounted machine guns. The impact of the interrupter gear Eindecker, however, was enormous. The heretofore appreciated stability of the Allied aircraft now became a liability as they could not escape the more maneuverable Eindecker. I do know that uh, that synchronization device changed, um, changed the equation because now German aircraft could strafe. Uh, they could fire at other aircraft and so then there was a scramble on the other side to develop our own synchronization mechanism. Uh, and, it, and, and as much as there were tides in the air war, the, the Fokker scourge really was uh, a turning of the tide and then force the other side to come up with an answer to it. By late 1915, the Germans had achieved air superiority, making Allied access to vital intelligence derived from continual aerial reconnaissance more dangerous to acquire. In particular, the essential defenselessness of Allied reconnaissance-type aircraft was exposed. Our enemy was the Fokker. And the one thing about the Fokker was it had a ceiling which was so high that it left every RFC airplane standing like a goldfish in a bowl with its nose up and not getting up at all. We could not reach it. And the system was to get up high and wait. And when it was up at about, say, 17 or 18,000 feet, we would come waffling along at about 10, and they would then dive down on our bombers. The French were forced to curtail their successful day bombing operations and turned to night bombing. The RFC began to suffer losses approaching two a day. The British called it the Fokker Scourge. The great German offensive against Verdun began in early 1916. In accordance with the German plan to bleed the French army dry, chief of the German general staff, Erich von Falkenhayn, determined to use their control of the air to do the same thing to the Army de l'Air and to blind the French artillery by shooting their observer aircraft out of the skies. The number of actual Allied casualties involved was, for various reasons, very small compared with the intensive air fighting of 1917-1918. The deployment of the Eindeckers was less than it could have been, the new monoplane was issued in ones and twos to existing reconnaissance squadrons. It would be nearly a year before the Germans were to follow the British in establishing specialist fighter squadrons. <laughs> 
Nonetheless, the impact on morale of the fact that the Germans were fighting back in the air, and effectively too, created a major scandal in the British press. Fortunately for the Allies, two new British fighters were already in production and were a technical match for the Fokker, the Airco FE-2B and the DH-2. These were both pushers and could fire forwards without gun synchronization. The FE-2B reached the front with No. 20 Squadron in January 1916 and the DH-2 in February. The Europeans um, were much more advanced than the Americans by 1914, 1915. They had been putting money in. Uh, so the aircraft were a little more aerodynamic. Um, they had better engines, uh, the, the, the rotary engines, uh, 90 horsepower uh, engines that the, the French in particular had developed, uh, gave them a little more power. Um, they also uh, had experimented with uh, monoplane designs as opposed to the biplane designs. Uh, so so they, they, were, they were mostly tractor uh, aircraft. So they, they were more advanced, but they were still pretty primitive. They were made out of wood and wire and fabric. Um, 100 miles an hour would be a really fast airplane. Um, most of them were flying, say, between 70 and 90 knots. Um, they might make 100 in a dive. Um, they were uh, capable of flying up to uh, eight, nine thousand feet, um, but uh, not for long. Um, not only because of the airplane, but because of the pilots. You didn't have oxygen. You didn't have the uh, the all weather gear. So their their ceiling was limited by the fact that that they're still open cockpits. And once you start climbing, it gets really cold really fast, particularly in the wintertime. And remember, World War I starts in August, but September, October, November, December is coming really quick. Um, and so they had a very limited ceiling, very limited uh, speed. Uh, they were actually, some of them had um, maneuverability, not necessarily in their design, but because of the, the rotary engines. Uh, they could turn really tightly uh, in the opposite direction because of gyroscopic precession. Um, the engine's turning and they could turn off in the other direction very quickly. Turning in the direction that the engine was turning was another story. Uh, but they had a certain level of uh, maneuverability. But it, it, was, it was pretty, pretty limited. These were uh, boxy, draggy um, aircraft. Um, but they, they were far in advance of what had been flying just a few years before. For the opening six months of 1916, the Germans maintained control of the air until the Battle of the Somme. That air superiority was wrestled from their grasp, but slowly. The Eindecker, ironically, was unseated by aircraft already available before Fokker's invention of the interrupter gear and none of them ever had interrupter gear installed. It was the combination of four types of aircraft that defeated the Eindecker. Three of them were British, and they were all pusher aircraft. The gun bus, the FE-2B, and the DH-2. The fourth was the altogether far more impressive French Newport 11 BB. The tiny Newport 11, a tractor biplane with a forward-firing gun mounted above the arc of the propeller also proved more than a match for the German fighter when it entered service with Escadrille N3 in 1916. With these new types of aircraft, the Allies re-established air superiority in time for the Battle of the Somme, and the Fokker scourge was over. Fighter pilots were of varied origins. A good number, like Manfred von Richthofen, transferred from the cavalry, which had lost its function in the face of barbed wire and the machine gun. Some, like the British ace James McCudden or the German Werner Voss, 
were drawn to aviation because of an interest in machines and worked their way up from ground crew to pilots. Pilots in general were extremely young. British ace Albert Ball was a squadron leader at the age of 19. Many of them were also quite short. Cockpits were small and weight was a prime factor in aircraft performance. French ace Georges Guinemer was a case in point. He weighed less than 132 pounds and had been rejected as too frail for service in the infantry. In the flying corps, we had fires in the anteroom, and we were comfortable. And as, in, as a matter of fact, we were as well off as we should have been in England. As an ex-infantryman, all the time, I think, I was thinking of the infantry during that ter terrible weather. But when I left, my brother officer said, good heavens, haven't you seen enough planes come down in flames? I said, yes, but haven't you seen enough death in trenches? All the men who were actually working on aircraft were held before the commander. And he said something like this, he said, uh, you men must guard these aircraft with your lives. Without these aircraft, the uh, army is blind. We are the eyes of the army. And if it's between you and the aircraft, the aircraft comes first. We've got plenty of men, but we can't get aircraft. It certainly paid a pilot to listen, because he flew entirely from the ear. And after I had flown with these engines, something over 12 months, I could tell whether that thing is missing because it, the mixture was too rich or that a plug had cut out or a rocker arm had broken. From the moment he took off, the pilot never looked at his instrument again. Never. He, he went by the feel on the joystick, the feel on his feet and the wind on his face. It was all manual. Which was one reason why people who had been good horsemen tended to be good pilots. With the same delicacy of touch on the controls as opposed to a grab or a job in the mouth on a horse was what made for good and pleasant flying. Many would be pilots never made it to the front lines. The Air Service was unprepared for the challenge of training thousands of new pilots. The result was a great waste of young lives. Almost 500 American Air Service volunteers died just learning to fly. Engine failure taking off was one of the great causes of casualties. Uh, people tended to try and turn back and didn't put their noses far enough down to get a gliding angle and side-slipped or spun and crashed into the ground. When losses at the front were heavy, replacements were sent to combat units with 10 hours or fewer of flying time to their credit. This was not a certain death sentence, but it was close. Our training was pretty sketchy, because after all, at that period, everything, including flying, was frightfully experimental and tentative. There, for the first time, I really saw an airplane close to, handled it, touched it, and all that sort of thing. We had uh, a proper dual control machine which had the complete controls in the pupil's seat. And uh, during the course of instruction, one had a certain amount of instruction in the uh, dual control machine and a certain amount of instruction in the non-dual control machine. There was a, a, a fitter and a rigger on each aircraft who worked on that aircraft alone. And, and then we used to go down to the workshops and uh, be trained in rigging and sail making and the, those who were, who were for engines used to go to the engine shops and had uh, training on the engines. First flights were done with an experienced instructor at the controls. I can remember every 
minute of that flight it took off the engine sort of struggling to get up into the air and then the pilot throttled back a little and flattened out and how it went smoothly and then when he he took a turn a sharp turn I could see the ground and I looked up vertically and I could see the sky. And then we went round and it seemed as though across the nose of the plane that the world was whizzing round until he flattened out and went straight again. I don't know why, but it was a terrific thrill to me, this, the feeling of the plane being flown around. Eventually, the big day came, solo. Eventually, I did my first solo which was a terrifying experience, and only after Strugman had left me alone in the machine did I realize that I knew nothing at all about it, and I didn't even know what the controls did. As I was gliding in over the AID sheds onto the aerodrome, I found that I was undershooting. In other words, I was going to hit one of the hangars instead of getting over them. So in my panic, I did what I shouldn't have done. I jammed open the throttle suddenly, but, the Lord being on my side, the engine picked up, and I bounced up over that shed. I landed, the undercarriage collapsed, and down I went. It was a, a bad show to have crashed an aircraft. Loss of an aircraft was a serious matter. Even if you survived, you were made to feel that you might have been better off perishing in the twisted wreckage. Major Higgins came running across and he said uh, something like, if you want to kill yourself, you can, but don't kill one of my men. With only a few hours of flight time, the young airmen were sent to the front. Some of these young pilots testified to going through their first dogfight without seeing the enemy at all. Everything happened too fast. As the war continued, all sides got better at readying pilots for the shock of the war. But it was the Germans who made the most effort to prevent deaths in training and who prepared their trainee pilots best for combat. They disseminated knowledge of the principles of air combat worked out by veteran pilots and built up a body of highly skilled fighter pilots through careful selection of suitable individuals and their integration into fighter squadrons that fought in formation. The system did not break down until the end of the war, when heavy losses forced Germany to throw thousands of inexperienced pilots into the fray. Early in the war, individual fighters prowled the skies as lone hunters in search of unsuspecting enemy aircraft. For the first time in centuries, we entered again an era of individual combat. By 1916, fighter planes were being grouped in squadrons as tactics were developed for fighting formations, and a new breed of warrior was born, the fighter pilot. When people think about the horror of war, and you, and you want a, a, uh, a picture of just how bad war can get, World War I pretty much gives it to you. That, that trench warfare that was going down there was, was just, it was horrific. Um, and these fighter pilots, or, or all of the pilots really, they were kind of above it all. Um, they were flying above the trenches um, and uh, they began to take on kind of the aura more of medieval knights. Um, this was a far more noble war. Um, and so they, they, they saw their role differently uh, than these, these groundlings down here who, who, were, who were fighting in the mud. They, they, were, they were noble, they had a code of chivalry about them. Uh, a real culture developed around these, these, uh, these warriors, these air warriors from Germany, from France, from Britain, eventually from the United States. Um, and as such, they were, they were inventing a new way to fight war. Um, and um, they go from kind of being the individual knights in the air uh, 
to more um, disciplined military units, um, flying as squadrons, uh, flying in formation, uh, uh, practicing tactics. For example, the idea that one way that you could more uh, readily um, utilize aircraft is the fact that they could come in from several different directions and several different heights. So anti-aircraft uh, guns, uh, flak, whatever they would have, uh, would not be able to, to target them. As members of Flight Section 62, Max Immelman and Oswald Bolke were among the first pilots to be issued with the Fokker Eindecker and they used Anthony Foker's new plane to deadly effect. Immelman's exploits in the skies over the Western Front made him a national hero. His dominance over Allied airmen was cut short when he was killed in June 1916 from a faulty interrupter gear, which caused him to blow off his own propeller. His greatest legacy was a tricky maneuver called the Immelman Turn a move that is still a crowd thriller at modern air shows today. During the battles of Verdun and the Somme, Allied and German airmen fought for air superiority. Losses on both sides were heavy in the air, as well as the attrition on the ground. Numerically inferior, the German aircraft tended to stay on their own side of the trenches and concentrate their resources in ever larger units capable of winning the local air superiority on crucial sectors of the front. Thanks to Oswald Bolke, the German pilots had an edge in the battle for the skies. Bolke is considered to be the father of the dogfight. He argued for the grouping of hand-picked pilots in fighter squadrons, or Jadstaflen, as the leader of Yasta II, he passed his knowledge on to many of Germany's greatest flyers, including Manfred von Richthofen. Bolke also set down the principles of combat known as Bolke's Dicta. These rules stated that pilots should attack from behind and out of the sun, fire only at close range, and when attacked from above, turn and face the enemy. In the fall of 1916, he shot down 21 Allied aircraft in two months, increasing his total to 40. As with most of the great aces of the war, his luck ran out. On October 28, 1916, during a fierce dogfight, he collided with another German aircraft and spiraled to earth and his death. British flyers that were once his prey honored their enemy by dropping a wreath at his burial site, inscribed to the memory of Captain Bolke, our brave and chivalrous foe. These men were part of a rare breed, soldiers who fought one-on-one -on -one far above the stench and carnage in the trenches below. Britain's Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, told a wartime audience that airmen were the knighthood of the war, without fear and without reproach. Not all aces spent time looking for skilled opponents. British ace Edward Mannock was noted for his hatred of Germans and contempt for gestures of chivalry. His comment on the death of Germany's most famous ace, Baron von Richthofen was, I hope he roasted the whole way down. He once chanced upon six German aircraft on a training flight. He shot down the instructor and then picked off the five defenseless students one by one. But even those who were less savage in their rejection of the ethic of chivalry took great pleasure in a kill. Fighter pilots drove to view wreckage of aircraft they had shot down over their own lines to examine the bodies and collect souvenirs. There is no doubting the adrenaline rush that many individuals experienced through combining the thrills of fighting and flying 
even laughing in the face of danger. Many soldiers stuck in the damp, verminous trenches undoubtedly looked on the airmen with envy. I knew what war was like. I had seen death, too much of it. And also I did know that flying, it would soon be over if you'd come to the end of your life. You didn't have to sleep in mud night after night, day after day. But I think the main reason was that I very much wanted to fly. A flyer had a warm, dry, lice-free bed 10 or 15 miles behind the lines. There was never any shortage of volunteers for the air service. During any lull in the action at the front, French elite pilots were in the habit of flying off to Paris, where they would be familiar figures in the best nightclubs, always with attractive women in attendance and a stylish automobile parked outside. British fighter squadrons were more noted for their drunken sprees and riotous behavior in the mess. Yet few pilots relished the idea of embarking on a dawn patrol with a stinking hangover. It tended to be an experience that a man would have once and never again. But the war in the air had more in common with the war in the trenches than is often recognized. There was a grueling attrition of pilots and aircraft. Freshly trained British pilots arriving at the front in 1917 had an average life expectancy of a little over two weeks. Like shell-shocked infantry, airmen were prone to nervous breakdowns as the strain of combat intensified and losses mounted. Every ace was first and foremost a survivor. In a world of great aviators, the greatest hunter of the skies was a charming and humorous Prussian known by his admiring foe simply as the Red Baron. Baron Manfred von Richthofen transferred from the Prussian cavalry to the air service in 1915. Having flown as an observer and a bomber pilot in the east, he was chosen by Bolke to join his Yasta in France. Eventually, he was given command of Yasta 11. Because of its garishly colored machines, the British soon christened the unit Richthofen's Flying Circus. Arrogant and ruthless, he showed few signs of chivalry or respect to his enemies. He was known to especially despise the French. Where many pilots use sport as a metaphor for combat, Richthofen saw it in terms of hunting, a favorite activity. He once wrote, when I have shot down an Englishman, my hunting passion is satisfied for a quarter of an hour. Having survived a head wound during a dogfight in July 1917, Richthofen was pressured by his superiors to withdraw from combat. He was so beloved by the German people that it was felt by the Kaiser that his death would be a crushing blow to German morale. In spite of this concern, during the 1918 spring offensive, he climbed back into the cockpit. On April 21st, the Red Baron was shot through the heart while pursuing a British Sopwith. Whether he was shot by an Australian machine gun or Canadian pilot, Roy Brown, is still debated. He came down behind Allied lines and was buried with full military honors by the enemy he terrorized. His final victory total was 80 Allied aircraft destroyed. No other pilot would reach that total until World War II. The best fighter pilots were far from immune to the pressure of the war. Before they died, and most of them did die, many were broken from too many hours in the air. Some drove themselves beyond human limits. The great French ace Guynemer feared that if he withdrew from combat, 
people would say it was because he had won all the awards. He was unfit, physically ill, wrecked by paranoia and insomnia, yet he died while flying. Like a fable warrior legend, Guynemer would vanish on a mission. Not a trace of him or the aircraft was ever found. A few aces died a hero's death. One was German Werner Voss. On September 23, 1917, Voss, flying alone in his pale blue Fokker, was attacked by an entire flight of SE-5s led by James McCutton. As the SE-5s dove, he spun on his tail to face them. Two British machines were forced out of the fight, shot up by Voss's bullets, but then the Germans' luck ran out. Arthur Davids latched onto his tail and raked the triplane with repeated bursts of fire. McCudden saw Voss's plane hit the ground and disappear into a thousand pieces. He later said it literally went to powder. Such deaths were rare indeed. McCudden himself died in a mundane flying accident when returning from a spell in Britain to take command of a squadron in France. No matter how they died, to their generation they were the equivalent of the Knights of the Round Table and an inspiration to a future generation of flyers. This is the myth of the Ace's legacy that lives on 100 years later. In the early years of aviation, navies were, on balance, more aware of the potential of aircraft than the armies. From the outset, the Navy's problem has been to bring aircraft into the mobile operating forces of the fleet. We may say that this had its start in World War I and post the post-World War I period when kite balloons were used from battleships and auxiliaries for gunfire spotting and tactical reconnaissance. The equipment was very cumbersome, and as hydrogen was used as the lifting gas for the balloons, we found that it was not a satisfactory measure of doing a naval job. So they were abandoned after a short, relatively short trial. U.S. naval aviation began with pioneer aviator Glenn Curtis, who contracted with the Navy to demonstrate that airplanes could take off from and land aboard ships at sea. The U.S. Navy and Glenn Curtis experienced two firsts during January 1911. On January 27th, Curtis flew the first seaplane from the water at San Diego Bay. And the next day, U.S. Navy Lieutenant Theodore G. Spuds Ellison, a student at the nearby Curtis School, took off in a Curtis grass cutter plane to become the first naval aviator. Meanwhile, Captain Henry C. Mustin successfully designed the concept of the catapult launch and in 1915 made the first catapult launching from a ship underway. Britain's Royal Navy was under the influence of an imaginative, progress-minded First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, who made his interest in aviation felt. But when the war started, there was no effective way of taking aircraft to sea with the fleet. In September 1914, the Royal Navy converted three cross-channel steamers into seaplane carriers. The seaplanes were winched off the ship to take off from the sea and lifted back on board after the mission. It sounded simple and effective, but was not. The seaplanes found taking off and landing at sea impossible, except under highly favorable conditions. They needed exactly the right degree of swell, which was highly unlikely at sea. Even with these drawbacks, the first naval air raid of the Great War occurred on December 25, 1914 when 12 seaplanes from HMS Engadine, Riviera, and Empress attacked the Zeppelin base at Cookshaven. Fog, low clouds, and anti-aircraft fire prevented the raid from being a complete success, but the raid demonstrated the feasibility of attack by shipborne aircraft 
and showed the strategic importance of this new weapon. There were attempts to add launch platforms to existing capital ships. Based on these experiments, the Royal Navy concluded that aircraft were useful aboard ship for spotting and other purposes, but that interference with the firing of guns caused by the runway built over the foredeck and the danger and impracticality of recovering seaplanes that alighted in the water in anything but calm weather more than offset the desirability of having airplanes aboard. However, shipboard naval aviation had begun in the Royal Navy and would become a major part of fleet operations by 1917. Through most of World War I, the world's navies relied upon float planes and flying boats for heavier than aircraft. But in 1917, the Royal Navy resumed experiments with shipboard aircraft launch and landings. The maneuver was undertaken by the highly agile Sopwith Pup biplane. Taking off was relatively easy if the ship sailed into the wind, but landing was another matter. The plane managed it twice by matching its speed to that of the ship, so he could effectively hover down like a helicopter, helped by other pilots on deck who grabbed rope toggles on the wing and pulled it down as the pilot cut the engine. All went well until the third attempt, which proved fatal, and the pilot, Squadron Commander E.H. Dunning, drowned. Nevertheless, by 1918, Sopwith Camels launched from Furious carried out the first ever successful airstrike by carrier-borne aircraft, bombing Zeppelin sheds at Tondern in July 1918. The real beginning of naval aviation, let us say, took place in England, where during World War I, the latter part of it, the British converted two ships, the Furious and the Argus, and built into them the features which were desirable for aircraft launching and recovery. Uh, I happened to have been in England at about that period and kept our Navy Department informed of the progress of the British in this field. As a result, the Navy embarked on a initial program of converting the old Collier Jupiter into our first flat top, the Langley. In the last months of the war, an ocean liner was converted into the HMS Argus, the first true aircraft carrier. Modern naval aviation had been born.